Welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS and a very warm welcome to our weekly review of international events. This survey we compose, edit, curate for you with a very special purpose of making things comprehensible to you, whatever is happening on international arena and how you should analyze them from the point of view of your competitive service examinations. What is important to bear in mind that whatever happens in any part of the globe has a bearing on India's national interest and it influences our foreign policy formulation and its implementation. There are security dimensions, there are economic dimensions and of course there are cultural dimensions. There is a continuity, there is something in the past and there is something which is happening which is taking us towards the future. This is what our effort always has been. And this has been a very dramatic week. Um, the British Prime Minister finally agreed to resign. We'll discuss in some detail what it means for Britain, what it means for the rest of the world, and particularly for India. Uh, then the Afghan leader, Ahun Zadeh, made a very rare appearance, and the Taliban in Afghanistan is completing almost a year. So what is the stock of their governance? They have still not been recognized by anybody in the world, but different countries in the world have had a working relationship with them to suit their own interests. What is India doing this uh, in this regard? We have to watch that. Another interesting thing to look at would be the G20 meeting in Bali recently. Our Prime Minister participated virtually in the G7 plus one meeting recently. He was the only uh, leader to be in included into this very, very select gathering. And can we sustain the momentum in G20? And what is what does G20 mean in the world changing very swiftly is something we'll, we'll look at. In the meantime, the Europe also has been causing some concern. Um, President Macron lost majority in the parliamentary elections. The Germans are having problem by resorting back to coal and having some tensions with their Green Party colleagues. There also is the issue of NATO, which is trying to increase in size, have a more belligerent posture, but keeping Ukraine conflict in mind, also into mind what red lines it should or should not cross, what would be the implication of fast-tracking Ukraine's membership in EU, what would happen to Sweden and Norway joining NATO, all this we'll have a, to take a close look at. First of all, the developments in Great Britain or United Kingdom. Nobody had expected that Boris Johnson would be forced to leave the Prime Ministership so soon. It's only a little uh, more than a month ago when he had won the no confidence motion in his party and then the rules do not permit another no confidence motion to be put against him for another year. So he thought he was safe and secure in his seat for another year. Now, the issue of Boris Johnston resigning raises some very important questions. He has been one of the most, if not the most controversial Prime Minister of Britain in recent times. He is full of bravado. He is uh, very, very bohemian in his lifestyle. He belongs to the upper crust of the upper class uh, British society. He is distantly related even to the Queen. And he sort of came out with his crumpled suits, untucked in shirts, at times with tie, at times with not ties. It, this was... Uh, this was a kind of an insouciance which he projected that I couldn't care less what others think about me. He had this mop of hair uh, unruly on his head. Uh, the tie was at times loose. But this was a carefully calculated image which endeared him ironically with even the working classes uh, in Great Britain in his country. They thought that he was a person who was not stuck up, who was not snobbish, who was informal. He had been a journalist in the past. He had been a foreign secretary. He had been the mayor of London. So it is not as if he had not held positions of political power and responsibility in his country. But always his uh, attitude had been to challenge the norms, the conventions, uh, the forms of governance and try to project himself as a flamboyant, charismatic person who could take strong decisions. He had a way with world, words. It had always been said that he had carefully lied his way through. Uh, he was economical with truth, they said, but as a prime minister, uh, he took some time to decide whether he would support Brexit or oppose Brexit. But once he made up his mind, he came out fighting wholeheartedly in favor of Brexit, taking Britain out of Brexit. And it cannot be denied that he had a reasonable role in campaigning for the referendum when 
uh, United Kingdom decided to walk out of the European Union and he carefully built up his persona and image to project himself after Theresa May's resignation to uh, the Prime Minister's office. But once he became the Prime Minister, it was quite clear that he had no clear plan for future. He had, he had opted for a hard Brexit, he had brought Britain out of uh, European Union, but what next? He did not have any policy about the Irish backstop. He seemed to care not too much about the treaty obligations which a sovereign country which he led had made to European Union. He would first of all say that the European Union leaders would blink first. He would try to play the games of brinksmanship. So this was on. But at the same time, everything which he did was tainted with some kind of an unethical, immoral kind of a content. He could, not, he could not lead the country very well during the COVID. Actually, the Partygate scandal which continued to hound him was that he projected an image that there was one set of rules for the people who were being ruled, the commoners, and one set of rules for the ruling elite who could flout it. So he had an official party during the COVID lockdown in his official uh, office come residence number 10 Downing Street where lots, bring your booze was the invitation card. And some people threw up, some people misbehaved, but the whole thing when the scandal broke out, broke out people thought it was bad enough a misdemeanor to lose office. But he brazenly tried to browbeat everybody and uh, he said that, look, I have been returned with a massive majority in 2019. So the people like me, people have given me a mandate and there is no question of my being, uh, you know, giving up or being answerable to anybody else, media or anywhere else. Slowly, from Donald Cummings to uh, Dominic Cummings to his other aides, started criticizing him. There was a senior civil servant, Susan Gray's report, which indicted him. Uh, for some time, he tried to save himself by the Metropolitan Police launching an inquiry, and the senior civil servant's report was, if not shelved, delayed for a while. But ultimately, the police also fined him, imposed a fine on him. So. It is a conviction of sorts. The, the police imposing a fine on a prime minister of the country amounted to saying that he definitely had committed a breach of law or breach of regulations which he himself, his government, had put in place during the COVID. So this was one part, the party gate. He also had an informal relationship, first of all, uh, with a lady who had walked in with him uh, to number 10 Downing Street, then they married, then they had a child. And the lines, the dividing lines between private life of a very rich, very spoiled, black kind of a prime minister and his public persona was being continuously breached. There were accusations that he had lied to the British monarch, he had misled her, he had lied on the floor of the House of Commons, he had tried to uh, lie his way through whenever it came to um, the Supreme Court, the High Court, the European Court of Justice, etc. So nobody could trust him on his words. And he would say that Trust me, I will lead you through this. Then there was a major fiasco about the education. The education system was practically dismantled during the COVID and the A-level uh, examinations, the admissions to... Uh, also, the prices were rising, jobs were lost, there were prices about national health service, there were issues about the racial prejudice in the police corps. So all this was... Uh, Mo the, uh, Boris Johnson's cup was running over even before uh, his party members show expressing lack of confidence on him. He was trying to compensate for it by strutting on the international stage. He would repeatedly go to Kiva, talk to Zelensky. He would visit India. He would say that, look, I am the strongest ally of Ukraine. I will fight um, as long as it is required to fight with them. He would make bold statements. But he was unfortunately not in a position to convince anybody that his own position was secure for a long time. Now, the last straw on the proverbial camel was the issue of Mr. Pincher, the deputy chief whip of the Conservative Party. He had been accused and convicted as way back as 90, 2009 for uh, groping men in a gay club and he had not uh, stopped ever since. So he was a serial offender, uh, serial sexual offender, including in place of work. Uh, and there was another MP who was uh, caught watching pornography in the House of Commons. Uh, so these were issues which he turned a blind eye, uh, deaf ear to. When he was asked that how could he appoint a person like this who had been convicted for uh, sexual offences um, in a senior position, he first of all, he said he, he did not know. Then he said he did not think that it was an offence. He did not, th I mean, the, his play with words ultimately could not this time get, get it out of this. Now what has happened is, uh, when 
the party members started resigning. There was a mass revolt when two of the senior most uh, colleagues, uh, Rishi Sunak, who was the chancellor of the exchequer, is number two in the British uh, system of government, whose official residence is also next door, number 11 Downing Street, and Javid, who was another uh, health secretary in, in his cabinet of Pakistani origin. These two people resigned and he appointed two other colleagues in their position and thought that he would continue. He would say that I'll reshuffle the cabinet, but I'll continue. I've been given a responsibility. I will not run away from it. But that's what happened in the next two days was very, very dramatic. It was like a landslide. Almost 50 members, senior and junior members of the cabinet, uh, senior members, junior members, parliamentary secretaries, principal secretaries resigned en masse. So there was almost 50 people from the Conservative Party who resigned, walked out of the government, and the person he had appointed in place of Rishi Sunak also went to 10 Downing Street and advised his boss to resign. So this was difficult for him to live through. He would, he, with great reluctance, he decided that he would resign. He may address the press conference. But he's a man who, li like a cat, the proverbial cat with night lives, doesn't give up. He said, I would like to continue as a transitional uh, caretaker prime minister between now and autumn, in October. But nobody is willing to give him this respite because they don't know what mischief he is capable of even still what damage he can do already to the image of Britain, the state of economy, and other things. Now, interestingly, what has happened for the Conservative Party is that in recent elections, parliamentary by-elections, they lost some of their citadels. They lost two seats where they had comfortably won, two opponents. Now, the interesting situation is this, that the rules still do not allow the Conservative Party to bring another motion of no confidence against Boris Johnson immediately. They can have... a no confidence motion in the House of Commons, which will take priority over everything else, and it would have to be voted. Debate would have to be uh, scheduled next day. Voting would be over in a couple of days. But the Conservative Party doesn't want this to happen because if Boris Johnson loses the no confidence motion in the House of Commons and resigns, then the chances are that the Conservative government would not be, no Prime Minister of the Conservative Party would be the caretaker government. There are other wheels, other wheels within wheels. Now, people have started distancing within the Conservative Party from Boris Johnson, like Rishi Sunak, like uh, Ms. Patel, like uh, Javed. Uh, now, we should not forget one more thing. These people have been accomplices. They have been complicit in whatever Boris Johnson has done. Till only day before yesterday, they were defending him in both House of Commons and they're trying to say that, look, we did not know. But Rishi Sunak also had been slapped with a fine by the police on the party gate scandal. And also he himself, unfortunately, has been tainted uh, considerably by his wife who not filing taxes, uh, not filing returns transparently enough about her income. Uh, she is an NRI, she, she is the daughter of the billionaire Naran Murthy, the founder of Infosys. But all these things seem to expose the underbelly of the British uh, parliamentary system that whether you take a Labour Party, whether you take a Conservative Party, whether you take Boris Johnson or you take somebody else, even in the days of Margaret Thatcher, her son was accused of making deals with armed dealers in Africa and so on. But here we have the venality, the corruption and the brazenness which with the ruling party uh, leaders scratch each other's back. They do deals which are mutually beneficial with uh, Russian oligarchs which allow them to buy football clubs, by theatres, and then allow them to continue living in that country. That's one part. The second part is that what Ms. Patel as the Home Secretary did is to have, have these uh, refugee seeker, asylum seekers being sent to Rwanda. So the point is that there, is, there are two levels of the arguments. First of all, the curiosity in India is that will the person of an Indian or an Indian Pakistani origin become the next Prime Minister of Britain? Whether it is Rishi Sonak, whether it is Javid, whether it is Ms. Patel, Priti Patel, all these are frontline contenders. They are far ahead of uh, the uh, Foreign Minister Liz or anybody else. Another lady um, from an Indian origin also is, is, is in the contest. But this is not important because this is the kind of um, games which Indians play foolishly. They think that how many people of Indian origin are American senators, governors, even the vice president. But those people do not identify themselves 
as part of Indian diaspora. They are part of the political game in their countries of domicile, in their countries which they have settled down to, where they are citizens. So Indians should not uh, waste too much time speculating on this one. What they should uh, worry about is that how the instability in the governance in Britain is going to affect its impact on international relations or relations with India, both in terms of economics or elsewhere. Just before the news of Boris Johnson's resignation came, there was another news item which was very interesting, that the Indian Defence Minister Rajnath Singh Ji had cancelled, if not cancelled, postponed his tour of United Kingdom because of some dissatisfaction that the meetings, the engagements fixed for him were not at a level which was commensurate with his status. Now also there is an undercurrent of racism which is apparent in the United Kingdom no less than anywhere else, whether it comes to demolishing the statues or taking them away of the colonial people like Cecil Rhodes and others. But there is this super serious uh, tone in the ruling elite of uh, United Kingdom, which Indians should realize it is part of reality. So there are Indians which are active in universities, they are in high echelons, there are many in the House of Lords, etc. But these is this is more or less a symbolic representation. Can they really assume positions of power and will the British electorate Put up with that is one question which we must think about. The second thing is that the Boris Johnson was a very stern opponent of the breakup of the United Kingdom. So whether it is the Irish backstop and the resentment in Ireland since Sinn Féin uh, formed government or whether it is the Scotland which is hankering for another referendum and which Boris Johnson was uh, resisting, will this now take a different complexion is there? And of course, what will happen to the Brexit and the British economy is directly having a bearing on India. Because if Britain is number five in the economy, India is number six, and this time India had, was pipped to the post by Britain only by a $30 billion dollar margin. So I think Indian interests do not necessarily always converge with the interest, economic interests of United Kingdom and Great Britain. We have an affinity of language, we have an affinity of uh, Westminster system of model of governance, but neither in England nor in India the Westminster system seems to be working in absolute perfection. In India, we have a written constitution. In Britain, they live by the law of conventions. And Boris Johnson was a one-man demolition gang who was wrecking all conventions. It was a damage done worse than President Trump in England. This is what we have to take a stock in an old dispassionate manner. The G20 meeting, which is taking place in Bali, is an exceptionally important meeting in the context of not only this organization, but in the larger perspective of the world changing since the Ukraine war in Europe. Uh, the Indian Prime Minister had recently participated in the G7 plus one meeting virtually, and it was being speculated that India's significant role in the emerging structure of international relations is being recognized. I think greater wisdom is in realizing that it is not India's stature which is being recognized. It is the effort by the Western countries, the rich countries, G7 ultimately is a club of rich countries, is to persuade India somehow or other, tempt it, lure it to move away from its emerging uh, relationship, economic and military, with Russia and one step removed with China since the Ukraine war. Now, India has a relationship with China which is adversarial, particularly after the conflict and confrontation in Galwan Heights in Ladakh two years back. But the problem is, as we have discussed in past, India's trade with China is burgeoning. It has grown uh, even during these two years since Galwan, despite uh, COVID, and Indian uh, imbalance of trade vis-a-vis -vis China is a problem for India. So India wants to increase trade with China so this trade imbalance can be redressed. But if that continues, India's dependence on uh, intermediaries for China would increase. India's export with other countries depends on um, equipment received from China and, or supply chain from China. And this would make it very easy for China to twist India's arm when it comes to the border. Now, but all these things apart, let's see what is the difference between G20 and G7. Uh, 
according to us g20 is a far more important multilateral forum of negotiations because it it comprises the members who account for 85% of the gdp of the world and 75% of the international trade so i mean it of course includes all the g7 countries but it includes besides the g7 countries argentina it includes brazil it includes mexico it includes saudi arab it includes china and Uh, Russia it includes India and Indonesia it of course has the European Union so if you look at this this is a more representative assembly of rich developed and the developing and when we say developing there are gradations within the developing nations which are there so the the interaction between these two is not north versus south it is not east versus west it is not capitalism versus communism of the cold war years but it is a very heterogeneous uh, group of nations which interact together and try to coordinate their conflict and uh, interests which are coinciding group interests individual interests and then the categories are very different the other interesting thing about this g20 meeting is that this india is going to be the chairperson of this uh, body from this time this meeting this bali summit onwards till november 2023 so india for one year will have uh, the responsibility and the opportunity to guide the agenda of g20 to its own advantage uh, not tilting it uh, selfishly towards own end but persuading other members of the developing nations as well as developed nations that this is what they should follow uh, then the diplomacy in g20 takes place at two parallel levels one is called a sherpa track the other is called the financial track now the sherpa track is supposed to be very very important uh, almost 100 odd meetings take place during a year in under the g20 under the auspices of various ministers dealing with subject areas of their interest there would be environment there would be health there would be technology there would be trade there would be nutrition there would be vaccines you you name it environment so all these need like in mountaineering the sherpa prepares the path for the climber to reach the summit so before a summit take place the sherpas work tirelessly from different countries for a year coordinating these meetings and most of these meetings will now take place in the coming year in india one of the meetings has created already some controversy when india said that one meeting will be held in um, shrinagar the chinese said that look we our position on kashmir is well known it is a leg- legacy problem but they have not said that they would not participate there and indians also are playing a game which is very interesting because at the g20 meeting in bali it would be a very interesting situation where first of all a new sherpa has been appointed and the new sherpa who has been appointed is amitabh kant the ceo of niti ayog who has just demoted office in ceo uh, he has enough experience of uh, making india digital technology um, trying to have the transmission of uh, um, filtering down of benefits to um, of various governmental schemes so whether it is welfare in economics whether it is policies which are innovative whether it is in the digital domain there is a man who's been put in charge and he has been put in charge in a position is a position where a minister used to be there like piyush goel so it is a recognition that the sherpa's job is a whole time job and with india assuming the chairpersonship of this the body will need a whole time person competent who has diversity of interests and experiences to do this before in past there has been montek singh helwalia or suresh prabhu so montek singh helwalia of course was a deputy chairman of the planning commission and of course uh, um, suresh prabhu was a cabinet minister so it is recognizing the role of the sherpa that uh, amitabh kant has been interested with this responsibility now interestingly um, we see that indians have in various organizations been asked to take care of technology transfers climate change environment vaccine cultural exchanges uh, agriculture now all these there is a commonality in india's interest with developing nations and there is a community of interest between all these developing countries with the developed countries elsewhere there are areas where indian interests coincide with chinese interests there are areas where indian interests clash with chinese interests so this will have to be carefully calibrated that's one part the second part is this that this forum in bali will provide an opportunity 
for the Indian foreign minister to talk to. He began his negotiations in Bali with an hour-long conversation with the Chinese foreign minister. And he made it very clear to the Chinese foreign minister that the priority is that the border issue should be resolved, tension should be reduced there before any other progress can be made in any other field. The Chinese known position is that let trade prosper, let uh, military confrontation be put on the back burner. So the Indian foreign minister has made it very clear that this is not going to happen. Uh, besides, Indian foreign minister would have an opportunity to deal with face to face with the Russian foreign minister. And the American foreign minister is also going to talk to uh, the Chinese uh, foreign minister. The American ranking general has already talked to his counterpart. So there is this forum where without having a bilateral, much publicized meeting, which may fail, which may succeed, people can fly different flights and meet each other here. So what is likely to be the follow through of the Bali summit? of the G20 is going to be a very, very interesting thing for India to watch. Now, the, the same things, when India is part of the quads, the same kind of a portfolio or the mandate is given to India, that India should do this. India also is a member of BRICS. India also is a member of the SCO. Now, how does India's participation on these fora fit in with what is happening in G20? We would think that in coming year, because India is assuming the presidency, G20 will be probably the most important forum for India to conduct its multilateral diplomacy and take advantage of that in bilateral. Saudi Arabia is going to be there and India has built up its relationship with Saudi Arabia and UAE with very great care and nuanced manner. It, they have also survived the, some tensions about reckless statements made by the ruling party's spokesperson in India about uh, the Prophet Muhammad peace be on him. But then the problem is that the Indians would have to again think how are they going to have their set of bilateral relationships, say for Saudi Arabia, say with South Africa, say with Brazil or Argentina, with Russia and China and then carry on in this multilateral forum. There is Australia there and Indian Australian relationship has been uh, on the upswing recently, but then Australian-Chinese tensions are not going to last forever. The Indonesia is there, which is the largest country in the ASEAN region, and not always do the interests of Indonesians and other ASEAN countries, say for instance Myanmar or Cambodia uh, or even Philippines, coincide. So it is a tricky situation. It is a mini United Nations but where without any veto wielding members at all. Of course, there will be a carrot dangle before India again that if it does this, if it does that, uh, it might find it possible to enter the Security Council, which is not worth, the candle is not worth the game as they say. Korea is also part of the G20 and the Indo-Korean economic relationship and technological transfers have been at a very high level. So there are these things which the Indian delegates, the Indian Sherpa would have the opportunity of building on. Events in Europe have been causing some concern almost all over the world. First of all, President Macron had won a historic re-election in France, but very soon after that, he lost his majority in the parliamentary elections, which rendered him practically a lame duck president in the American terminology. So will he be able to implement any policy initiatives which he was looking forward to? Would he be able to play a role on the international arena, which he was projecting for an autonomous security policy for Europe, which he thought he would need. He had a presence in Africa in UN peacekeeping operations through French Legion. He had even offered to bring economic health back to Lebanon, which had once been a colony. It had met with some resistance with erstwhile colonies like Mali elsewhere. But in totality, it seems that France, like most other nations in the developing world, doesn't quite know its own mind. Uh, when the parliamentary majority was lost for Macron, it was both the extreme right and the extreme left which gained and the center could not benefit, you know. So this seems to be uh, die hard far right, die hard far left, which seem to neutralize the middle ground of the center left or center right. So this is something which we have to keep in mind. Because uh, France, if it is rendered... Uh, 
incapacitated for some reason in international relations, it is likely to impact the total uh, influence of European Union in global politics. What is happening is that after the war in Ukraine, trying to keep on the same side countries, once parts of Eastern Europe, like Hungary and Poland, they drove a hard bargain. They said that they would not uh, agree to a consensus on aid given to Ukraine uh, unless they were given a physical monetary compensation for that. And ultimately, first European Union refused to, the leadership of European Union refused to bend down to this blackmail, but ultimately they had to give out large installments of financial assistance to Hungary and Poland to bring them back to line. It still doesn't uh, mean that the problem has been solved for all time to come. Uh, the, also, the other problem is related to Germany, the other major actor in the European Union. The Germany, as we have repeatedly discussed with you, is dependent more than anybody else on the Russian gas. And it will, willy-nilly, under the American pressure, under the consensus of the European Union, will have to cut down on gas imports from Russia. The real impact will be felt in the winters. But Germans have very early opted out of the nuclear generation of power. So they have no option but to go back to generation of power through coal. Now this is creating problems because the present coalition in Germany in, includes the Green Party and the Green Party is very much against uh, fossil fuels but and also Germany would be falling back on its commitment uh, about the climate change policies of zero emission by a certain date. So there are these and these are likely to have impact on the economic recovery post-COVID there. There also in Europe there are other issues which are going to be causing friction. The NATO has been trying to project, although NATO is not directly part of European Union, but NATO is part of the security of the European Union and the member states. Now, that is what Putin was saying that NATO should not cross certain red lines vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. But if NATO says that it will increase the rapid action force to 300,000, it would deploy its forces in the bordering states, uh, this would be considered provocative by the Russians and NATO doesn't seem to have the will to take on the Russians, put boots on the ground because that might be considered, that might trigger a conflict which might be very difficult to contain, it might escalate. So this, this is some kind of a shadow boxing. NATO is continuously losing its credibility as an effective force to protect people it is supposed to protect. And then there are differences between the role of NATO in the post-Cold War Europe. But under these circumstances, Sweden and Norway join NATO. And when they join NATO, it is impossible that they will not have joint military exercises, they will not have NATO um, soldiers in their countries, which might be considered provocative by the Russians. Already they have been provocative over flights by fighter aircraft over these two countries to put pressure on them. This is one part. Then again, the membership of the Ukraine is going to be fast-tracked. Now, what implication does it have for other uh, other countries? So you have you maybe you make a you fast track membership of Ukraine. You make Ukraine a full member of the European Union. Then does does it give you Ukraine a veto on the policies of the uh, European Union, like the other East European countries? What benefits does it get to Ukraine? Does it have anything more than a symbolic purpose? Then you say already or almost a trillion dollar plan for post-war reconstruction of Europe has been announced. So is the European Union going to raise fundraising, have crowd fundraising for this post-war reconstruction of Ukraine? And is, is the state of the European Union's own member states and its economy as a whole give it the justification that it can, uh, it can do this? So there are, there are several question marks on the effectiveness of the diplomacy of the European Union, the amount of influence it can exert as a multinational body in international relations, particularly in the context of human rights, war crimes, freedom of expression, democracy. Now, all these countries themselves, which stand for these values, do not always appear to act either entirely democratically or without if not a tyrannical but an autocratic style of functioning of the president, whether it is Macron or whether it is the German chancellor, who is curbed a little compared to Macron. But then Italy has political instability. Other countries do not have a very good economic health at the moment. Uh, other smaller members have conflict situations with Turkey. And Turkey, once willing to be a candidate member of European Union, has been kept out. So there are going to be ironical um, contradictions 
that you would have a country very close to Europe, very proximate to Europe, very keen to join Europe at one stage, being kept out, but other countries which have a totally different ethos being fast-tracked into the membership of the European Union. So it is going to dilute the identity and the brand equity of the European Union. And then again, there is an issue of Islamophobia, an issue of racial prejudice, and double standards about refugees coming from uh, non-Christian, non-European countries being uh, treated differently. All these issues and also violence erupting from time to time in supposedly peaceful blissful welfare states like Norway and Sweden is going to be a problem. So this is what we must keep in mind that when India thinks in terms of Europe, it has to at the moment have a calibrated nuanced policy which is more bilateral rather than treating European Union as a bloc. The supreme leader of the Taliban, Akhun Zade, recently made a very rare appearance. Not only he made a very rare appearance, he made a very significant statement. Now his statement uh, was very interesting. He said, why should the rest of the world interfere in our internal affairs? Why should the rest of the world be so worried about what is happening to our women, to our children, to our education, to our freedom of expression, our democracy? According to him, the position was very clear. Uh, the Islamic Republic Islamic Emirate of uh, Afghanistan is a sovereign state. It is perfectly free to conduct its affair in the Islamic, uh, according to Islamic law. And it says if the Islamic law gives certain rights to women, they will be respect respected. But if the Islamic law restricts their movement without covering their head or face or body, they also will have to be strictly complied with. If Islamic laws only allow women a certain right to education, to play primarily their role as housewives, rear children. Why not that? Why should the West try to impose its concepts of women's rights or education of all children equally on Afghanistan? That is one part. But what is the more dangerous part is this, that the, the, the Taliban is almost completing a year of its rule in Afghanistan. What is not st stopped, it is not only the violation of the rights of women, it is failed to control attacks on minorities, whether Shias or Hajras or others, even while they are praying in their mosques, even when their funerals are being conducted, even they have not even these these terrorists have not stopped attacking hospitals, schools, and office buildings. So this is a reign of terror of the Taliban variety of the worst kind. Nor have the Taliban been able to stop the ISIS elements, which they claim they have washed their hands of them, from attacking targets in Pakistan and elsewhere. So whatever be the power struggle between the ISIS, the, those who say they are running the Islamic province of Khorasan, and uh, the Taliban, is the matter of Taliban and the Afghan people. But what matters is that what was shown recently when an earthquake of 6.1 Richter uh, struck Afghanistan, that the Afghanistan is not in a position to look after itself, even to provide humanitarian relief in times of natural calamities. The infrastructure, infrastructure is badly damaged. It cannot repair it. The economic system has fallen apart. It cannot earn any money. It cannot feed its people. Uh, although the opium crops keep growing, the warlords in different provinces carry on their trade in contraband arms and drugs, but the common people do not have enough to eat. Their lives are not secure. More than 40% of the Afghan people are verging on malnutrition. Children are very close to feminine conditions and they are depending on remittances coming from outside, which cannot come regularly. International uh, relief agencies are working under very great stress. So whatever the Taliban supreme leader says, all is not well in Afghanistan, nor can the world leave Afghanistan alone following the claim that it is a sovereign state and it can, it can do what it wants within its territory because there is a spillover effect of whatever is happening in Afghanistan in neighboring countries. The violence spreads over, uh, the Islamic uh, terrorism spreads over from Afghanistan to Pakistan, flows over to India and also the other countries are not very happy about this. Uh, not Tajikistan, not Iran next door and uh, 
Pakistan might have been a willing party to whatever is happening in Afghanistan at the moment, but the relationship between Taliban, which were in prison in Pakistan for a long time, is not also very close and cordial. What is interesting is that though, although nobody is willing to recognize the Taliban, they are making arrangements behind the scenes to have informal uh, talks with Taliban to A, protect their own interests and to see that their strategic interests are not lost sight of. The Russians, the Chinese, the Qataris are all doing this. And Indians have also said that they would like to reopen their embassy and provide A, humanitarian relief to the Afghans who need it. And also there have been cases of people of Indian origin like six being murdered in their places of worship and Gurdwaras being targeted. So there is a very valid reason for India to have a presence in Afghanistan without recognizing the Taliban. But how these relationships will develop is only time will tell. So we should not make the mistake of overcommitting ourselves, overestimating our capacity to influence uh, developments in Afghanistan, but nor can we opt out and say that we don't care what is happening in Afghanistan. This is all we have for you this time. Uh, we would request you once again, like we do every time, that try to go over whatever we have discussed and try to reach your own conclusions. If you are discussing Boris Johnson's resignation, see what it means in terms for the decline of parliamentary democracy and rule of law in the mother of all parliaments in England. You can start thinking about what is better, a written constitution or a constitution which depends on convention. If there is a very ambitious person, if there is a person who believes in lying his way through and breaks all conventions, what remedy is there? What redressal is there? It also shows that the ruling elite, even in a developed country, even in a country of a mature de democracy, is not free from charges of corruption, from sexual abuse, and also not confirming to the rules of law of the land there's one problem which you must see. We saw this in Trump, Trump's case in America. We are seeing this in case of Great Britain. And from our point of view, it is not only a moral play. It is how it will impact on the influence of one's great power on international affairs. And even now, an important economic power on the rest of the world. And especially India's relationship with this country, which once ruled us, which has given us certain structures in our democracy, law and education. Then we go back to G20 and we see that how this multilateral forum is going to be forum is going to be perhaps the most significant uh, stage for India's diplomacy in the years to in the year to come because India is assuming the presidency of this, which is which will allow India to deal in terms of certain equality parity with both the richer countries and the developing countries at different stages of their development. We also must cast a look at Europe. What is happening in Europe? Europe is much too large. Uh, an area and countries together, taken together in European Union, still pull a lot of weight in terms of economy and strategy, in terms of technological sophistication. So, but it seems to be uh, having stresses of various kinds and no easy way out of those stresses. So how does India calibrate its policy towards Europe is another interesting question. In the neighborhood, Afghanistan, one year of Taliban rule is almost over. How long can we afford to shut our eyes to whatever is happening in Afghanistan? if especially if it is detrimental to our own interest in long run. Uh, think about this till we meet again. Thank you and goodbye.